This program is being presented to you by the Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. So good morning and welcome everybody to the central lecture of the Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. This is the winter school uh, uh, we have here in Linz this year and the topic of this winter school is the structure of space and time and more precisely from a physical point of view the structure of gravity theory which if it's relativistic is general relativity and the theory of relativistic matter. So um, you probably already met matter and uh, gravity as well. Now these are the relativistic versions of those and the famous Einstein equations that now celebrate their 100th birthday this year, these Einstein equations connect the matter contents of the universe with the gravity in the universe. Of course, matter gravitates. But what is new in general relativity is that matter, the gravitational effect of matter, is actually encoded in a change of the structure of space-time itself, namely in the curvature of space-time. So one side of the Einstein equations talks about matter, the other side of the Einstein equations talks about gravity. Now, there is an underlying notion that one needs to understand in order to even start talking about gravity or in order to start talking about matter, and that is the notion of space-time. Now space-time, of course, everybody can have an intuitive notion. It's somehow space and time together as one big space, but that notion is not good enough to talk precisely about it. Now a notion that is good enough is the one I wrote down here. So this is the physical key definition. It's the physical key object we need to talk about, and it underlies all modern physics, all, gravity, all relativistic physics, and it is the following. Space-time, this key notion is, I read it out, a four-dimensional manifold, well, a topological manifold, that carries a smooth atlas, whatever that is, that carries a torsion-free, whatever that is, connection, whatever that is, compatible with the Lorentzian metric, well, maybe you have a rough idea, and a time orientation sounds clear enough, well it has a precise mathematical formulation that satisfies the Einstein equations. What does this mean? Well that's the purpose of these lectures, to clarify this definition. And so you see all the colored terms here are terms we're going to define precisely and the white words are just a manner of speaking. Okay. Um, and down here, I wrote down the 24 lectures of the central lecture course up to number 12 is half the month. And then the full school starts with external lecturers, even more people, 50 scholarship holders from all over the world, I think 23 countries and so on, come. And that's the rest of the school. And uh, those of you who are so lucky to be here today don't have to follow this first course online, but the others will. But you see this color code here, all these unknown words, um, number one and two, topological, will be clarified in the first lecture this morning. What a manifold is and it carries dimension will be clarified in the second lecture and all the other terms will be clarified in the other color coded lectures and of course in the remaining lectures much more is going to be said about how this game here works with the Einstein equations but first we need to understand the central notion of space-time. So that's our plan and uh, so we have a tight schedule. Don't hesitate to interrupt, just ask into the classroom and uh, I will give you very brief answers. But there will be a tutorial this afternoon, actually every afternoon after the lectures there is a tutorial. There will be tutorial sheets out there. They're very nice tutorial sheets, okay? So the new thing is you don't have to think about them beforehand. You just go there. You can have a look at the sheets if you wish before. You should pick up uh, one from each uh, uh, stack 
And, um, but then actually we brought three supervisors who will take you through the sheet. And they're very simple exercises that make you accustomed with all the underlying notions. Okay, so you'll make much more of the school if you go to these tutorials. Okay, lecture one. Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, this is whenever I speak about physics, I need to be a bit grand. So, um, all modern fundamental relativistic physics, I think that's true. Okay, thank you very much. So, lecture one is topological spaces. So, we wish to talk about space time. And at the coarsest level, so if we don't look very closely, at the coarsest level, space-time is a set. Which means it just consists of points, which you may call the elements of the set, and that is it. However, this coarsest level is not enough to talk even about the simplest notions we would like to talk about in classical physics, namely continuity. Not enough to talk about continuity of maps. So you say, why do, you, do we want as physicists to talk about continuity of maps? Well, in classical physics, which this is all about, in classical physics, we have this idea that curves do not jump, no jumps. So if you have a curve, some particle running somewhere, later on this will be in space-time, we do not have the situation that all of a sudden there is a jump and say the trajectory of a particle continues all of a sudden in a totally different place. We do not want that, so we need to require, for instance, continuity of curves. Now, a set is not enough structure to be able to talk about curves being continuous or not on that set. And now you could, of course, imagine all kinds of structure on a set that allows you to talk about continuity. For instance, you could talk about a distance measure or something. But we need to be very minimal and very economic in order not to introduce undue assumptions and so we're interested in the weakest structure we can establish on a set, the weakest structure that can be established, so we need to do this by hand, on a set, which allows a good definition of continuity of maps. A set is not enough. And mathematicians know the weakest such structure we can establish is a so-called topology. This is the reason for the physicist, for the classical physicist, to look at topologies. So this is the motivation, this is the little cloud, so if you wish uh, all of this, you as a mathematician, all of this you are allowed to think. You're thinking this, okay, this is your motivation, but now we are precise. Definition. Um, let M be a set. A topology, a topology, curly O, the O will be clarified later, it stands for open, a topology with the name O is a subset of what? Of the set M? No. O is a subset of this monster P of M, and this monster P of M is a very simple thing. It's called the so-called power set. It's the power set of M. It's the set containing all subsets of M. So you make a choice of certain subsets of M. So O is a set of sets. A topology is a subset 
satisfying, not any such subset, satisfying three axioms. And these you always need to check. The first axiom is very simple. You require that the empty set, which is certainly a subset of M, the empty set you require must always be part of your collection that you call a topology. If the empty set is not in there, the O does not qualify it as a so-called topology for M. There's another set that always must be chosen to belong, namely M is clearly a subset of M, an improper subset. It also needs to be in the topology. First axiom, very simple. Second axiom, well, they're all very simple. Uh, the second axiom is the following. Assume you have a set U that is in the topology. So you made a collection of subsets and say you've chosen one that's called U. And assume you have chosen a second one that lies in there that's called V. Then for any such U in V, it must be true already. You need to check whether their intersection also has been chosen to belong to the topology. If that is not the case, the O already disqualified as a topology for the set M. It's very abstract at the moment, but it's also very simple. So the more abstract, the simpler it gets. We'll have many examples. Okay? The third axiom is, looks deceptively similar to this one, but with, not with an intersection, but with a union. But I say deceptively similar because it's somewhat different it says, assume you have sets U alpha that are in O, but not just U1 and U2, which I call U and V, but this alpha can come from an arbitrary index set. So here, if you wish, I chose the index set 1 and 2. I have two sets. But this index set could be the real line. It could be more than countably many elements. So this can be a huge collection of elements in this O. However, whatever amount of subsets in O you look at, the union, the big union over all of the ones you already have in O, this big union, these brackets are not necessary, they make the thing clearer, this big union also needs to be in O. If that is not the case, then the whole thing is not called a topology. That's it. This is the key definition of topology. And of course, the question is, what is this all about? And the other question is, can we have an example? Examples. Let's start very simply. Let's take a set M that just consists of elements 1, 2, 3. We need to understand this if we want to understand anything. Now, we could, for instance, make a choice of subsets. So I make big brackets, OK, big brackets. And this O contains subsets of M. For instance, it could contain the empty set. And it could contain the set 1, 2, 3, itself, and these are the only subsets of M, this O, let's call it O1, contains. The question is, is this a topology? Yes, it is. Is a topology. Let's quickly go through it. The empty set lies in it. The entire set, which is 1, 2, 3, lies in it. We take two arbitrary sets and check whether the intersection lies in there. I choose this one as U, and I choose the same one as V. Why not? Empty, intersected empty, is empty. Empty is already in there. I take this one, empty, intersected with this one. Empty, intersected with anything, is empty. Empty is already in there. I take this one with that one. Well, the intersection is symmetric. It's again empty. Empty is already in there. I take this one, intersected with itself. It's one, two, three again. It's already in there. Second axiom satisfied. Third axiom for the unions, the same holds true. 
we are only finite unions. This is a topology. Please. Um, no, in fact, it won't because, for instance, if m is the integers, n, then the power set of m is isomorphic to the reals. So, and the topology, you can choose O as the entire power set. That will be the next example. So the answer to your question, does the topology have to be countable? The answer is no, even if M is countable. Okay. Um, next example, B, same set up here. So the A should go here. O2 defined as the empty set, the set 1, the set 2, and the set 1, 2, 3. Is this a topology? The answer is no, because one union two, third axiom we need to check, one union two is the set one two is not in there, is not a topology. Okay? Now, um, you see, this is a very simple game if you are able to write down the topology explicitly. Now, there are two topologies you can establish on any set. So let's do um, example one, example two, m be any set. So for instance, the set of the integers, all the integers, all the real numbers, what not. We have the following example. You can choose the topology to be, to consist of only the empty set and the entire set. And this is a topology that has a specific name. It's called the chaotic topology. You can check this is a topology for any set M. There is a second topology that you can always write down, and that's the topology where you just take any subset of the chosen set, just any one, and because the intersection of two subsets is always a subset, and the union of two subsets is always a subset, and all the subsets are in there, this also is a topology, and this is called the discrete topology. Why should we worry about the chaotic and the discrete topology? The answer is because they're both utterly useless. They're utterly useless, but they're extreme cases. They're extreme cases because this is the topology with the fewest elements possible, and this is the topology with the maximum amount of elements possible, and they serve as test cases in order to construct extreme examples in topology in order to have an understanding of what the notions depend on. It's not a topology since the union of 1 and 2 is the, element, is the set 1, 2. And there's one, two, three. And the set one, two is not an element of the set because this is an element of the set, this is an element, this is an element, and this is an element. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so they're utterly useless, but they serve as good examples. Now, there is a very important example that we're going to use throughout and that will reconcile your intuition that you, of course, have from undergraduate analysis of continuity, which we're going to define soon, with the notion of topology. And that is the so-called standard topology. But whereas the chaotic and discrete topology, these two utterly useless ones, can be defined on any set, the ones I'm going to define now can only de be defined on RD. What is RD? RD is R cross R cross dot 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 cross R. And what is that? That's the set of all the D tuples of real numbers. So the PI are in the real numbers. So in RD lie tuples of D numbers. Okay, that's RD and that's a set. And now on this set, we want to establish a topology. 
We could establish the chaotic topology. We could establish the discrete topology. We could establish a great number of different topologies. We are now going to establish the topology that is usually chosen without saying it. OK? That's the point. And this is called the standard topology. So we want to define O standard. So this needs to be a subset of all the subsets of the power set of Rd, of course, because that's a topology. And you see here, I explicitly wrote down all the elements that belong to the topology. The same here, I explicitly wrote it down. Now, the standard topology will contain non-countably many elements. I can impossibly write them down explicitly. I have to define this implicitly and then to check whether this nevertheless uniquely defines a topology. Okay? So the way of definition is somewhat different, but the idea is, of course, the same. And the definition proceeds in two steps. The first step is you define the so-called softballs. What is a softball? A softball is a set B R sub R of a point P. So the point P is supposed to be in RD, and R is supposed to be an element of the positive reals. Well, this is going to be the radius of the ball, and this is going to be the center of the ball, if you like to think about it like this. But in fact, it's just a set. Namely, it's all the Q1, QD, no, it's a d-tuple, it's an element of Rd, um, for which it is true, now it comes, that if you take the i-th member of this point in Rd, you subtract from it the i-th member of the central point. So if this is the point P in Rd, then it has components P1 to Pd, okay? You square the differences, you go from i equals 1 to d, and you require that the whole thing is less than r squared. And of course you see, oh, what you're writing down here is just the Euclidean norm, is what you say. But I didn't speak of a norm, and I don't need to speak of a norm, and this is actually just defined on tuples. I do not need a vector space structure on rd to write this down. To write down a norm, you do. Anyway, this is the softball, and there's, of course, a softball for any R and any P. So that's step number alpha. Now, step number beta is the following. We declare that a set U be in the topology that we call the standard topology. By definition, by definition, if and only if, so that's the definition, the implicit definition, if the following is true. If for every point P of the set in question, there exists an R in R plus, such that the softball BR of P lies entirely in the set U. This is the definition. And of course, you can just think of this in a very simple way. But this is thinking, and the other thing is mathematics. You can think of it in the following way. Assume you're looking at R2, this special case, and you think this is part of R2 in your intuition. And now I'll take this set here where the boundary does not belong to the set, roughly speaking. And now the question, is it true that this set U, is it an element of the standard topology? Well, yes, it is. Because whatever point in U you pick, you find a intuition radius small enough such that the softball, who's, because there is not an equal sign, right? whose softball lies entirely in there, and that's true for every point. Whereas, if you had taken only some part of the boundary here to still belong to the set, you could have chosen a point on there, right? For any point, it must be true. But then, however small but positive you choose the radius, 
you would always have a problem here because the ball wouldn't lie fully in it. So this new set U is not an element of the topology, whereas before the set was. And now it's a simple exercise, but for reasons of time, I'm not going to give it. It's a simple exercise you might think about why it is true that the thus implicitly defined topology satisfies these three axioms. Okay? Maybe you want to think about this tonight. Okay? It's a very simple, it's a few line proof. Can I have the blackboard clean, please? It's a few lines proof, um, but, but we'll leave it out. But of course, these pictures you saw before, and you would have probably said this is an open set, and this is a, a non-open set, and so on. And this is precisely the reason for defining this special topology this way, to do on RD what you always knew. But it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be opportunities to maybe equip RD with a different topology if you have other than the standard purposes in mind. And later on, what we are of course going to do, we're going to think of M, the set as the points of space-time, and one big question will be, what topology should the physical space-time, or rather our mathematical model it, carry? There is a huge choice of topologies. Anything that fits into this scheme is a topology. Anything that fits into this scheme, as we will define now, suffices to define continuity of maps. Remember, we defined topologies in order to be able to define continuity of maps. Okay. Um, so this will be the next step. But before I go there, please do not be deterred if this is abstract at first sight. I don't know about your background. If you're a mathematician, you'll say, well, this is just how things go. If you're a physicist, you sometimes have to... Um, to think about in what places you usually implicitly make these assumptions. And one of the tasks in order to understand space-time is to make the implicit assumptions explicit. In fact, when Einstein wrote down general relativity, uh, he didn't understand many of the implicit assumptions. And it took him many, many years to overcome intuitive notions some might say obvious notions that nevertheless do not apply. So making things explicit uh, allows you to really understand the concepts. And you need to trust me that none of the mathematical notions I introduce is not necessary in order to understand the physics. So really every single bit later on when we proceeded further in the course, I will be able to point at the notions and say this is the physical effect of this and that choice. Okay? And it was actually I think in the second half of the 20th century that uh, uh, Wald and Ehlers and so on, they recognized general relativity, the theory of space-time, gravity and matter, must be studied on the differential geometry side at the level of rigor that mathematicians study differential geometry in order to really come to terms with the subtle notions of physics there. Okay? So you need to trust us that this is the cleanest way to introduce it, and everything is self-contained. Okay, so this is my, uh, these are my words of motivation here. So uh, now we define a topology. We, see, we saw a topology is something you need to choose. It's not automatically there. It's a choice. And whenever you make a choice, it's giving it's providing structure. So we have the following important terminology. And this is now only terminology. It's not definition. It's terminology. So we talked about M being a set. In fact, you can make it a problem. What on earth do we mean by a set? A collection of elements? Great. But what's an element and what's a collection? It's not so simple. You need to actually write down axioms for, for set theory. We're not going to do this. I leave you with the intuitive notion. Uh, if in doubt, we do zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice. Don't worry. Um, o, we call this a topology. 
and this is a set of subsets of M with certain properties. Now, if you think of a set together with a choice of topology, you think of this pair. I think of them together, and then this pair is called a topological space. It's more than a set. It's a set with additional, with additional information. Okay, that's a topological space. Now, uh, if U is an element of O, if U is a subset of M that lies in some chosen topology, which I called O, uh, then we call U an open set. This is just topology, uh, like terminology, topology too. Uh, it's a subset of M that happens to lie in the chosen topology is called an open set. So the topology is the set of open sets. But it's not like you would know what open is and then you have the topology. It's rather that open is defined by having chosen a topology. Okay? That's an open set. <clears throat> then there is another type of set. Let's call them A. Well, it's just a set. Uh, call a set A, which is a subset of M, which is a subset of M. Call the set A closed. Call it a closed set. When do we call it a closed set? We call it a closed set by definition if the complement of A, so if you take out A from the total space, if the complement lies in the topology. And uh, at this point, you think, ah, yeah, uh, closed is the opposite of open in some way. No, not in any way. There are open sets that are closed at the same time. For instance, the empty set. Because the empty set is in O, but M without the empty set is all of M is also in O. Ah, so the empty set is also closed. So the empty set is open and closed at the same time, for instance. There are sets that are open, but not closed. There are sets that are not open, but closed. And there are sets that are not open and not closed. Or in plain English, these two notions, in principle, a priori, have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. Of course, if you have chosen a topology, they're connected by this definition. Okay, so uh, I put up a warning sign. I will do this several times during these lectures. And the warning sign is that from open, it just generally not follow that a set is closed, neither the other way around, despite the deceptive terminology. Depends on what you look at. For instance, if you're a vacuum physicist, <laughs> in many cases, you indeed find examples where this, where this is useful. Okay. And nevertheless, it belongs to the whole picture. You cannot understand the other bits if you don't understand the extreme cases. That's the point. Okay. So now we got ourselves a topology. We got ourselves a number of notions you usually talk about. But now, why did we afford to buy a topology in our favorite topology shop? Okay. The point is, it does as a service, it yields a notion of continuous maps. Second, continuous maps. Okay. Now, first of all, we need to talk about a map. And you all know what a map is. A map is something that we call F, for instance. And it goes from one set into another set. So M is a set, N is a set. And this set we, of course, call the domain. And this set we call the target set. And a map is, of course, nothing but if I picture the set M, by the collection of its elements, and I picture the set N by the collection of its elements, then a map, you know it, takes every point from the domain to some point over there. For instance, these two points can be taken to the same point, not a problem. Um, this is all the map F. This point can be taken here. That point can be taken there. 
And, but there is no need that every point is hit. For instance, this point is not hit. Okay? And this point here is being hit twice. We have notions for that. If such diamond points exist, uh, we say the map F, the map F uh, is not surjective because they're certain not surjective because certain points in the target are not hit. If there exist points like the flower point, then we say the map is not injective because some points in the target set are hit more than once. You know these notions, injective maps, surjective maps, and maps. And a map is only defined between two sets. You need no further structure on the set in order to say what a map is, right? And not in order to say what in injective or surjective is. If it is injective and surjective, it's called, of course, called bijective and so on. However, I give you this map and I ask you a simple question. Is this map continuous? Does it make jumps? Now, you may have an intuition of whether it does or not. And the answer is, it depends. On what does it depend on whether this map is continuous? Well, in fact, so the, que the answer to the question of whether a map F from M to N is continuous depends, and it does so by definition, so not by some uh, divine intervention, but because we're going to define continuity like this, depends by definition on what topologies are chosen, what topologies, I think better English is which topologies are chosen on the domain M and the target space N. So in order to decide continuity of a map, you need to decide on some topology here, and you say that's the one I want here, and on a topology there, and only then can we write down a meaningful, useful definition of continuity. So this is again all the motivation around it. Let me be precise. Let M be a topological space with a topology which gets the name OM. So remember, it's the topology we established or we chose on M. And let the set N be equipped with a, of course, maybe totally different topology, because if this is a different set than this one, it can never be the same topology, right? Let these two be topological spaces. So there are sets on which, which you, each of which you gave more structure. Then a map F that takes you from one set into the other, and maybe for future reference, you know, this is, this is the name of the map. This is the set it starts from. This is the set it goes to. For future reference, I also say, if you now pick a specific element in M, then this is being mapped to, so this arrow is a little bit like these arrows here, okay? Um, this takes the individual element to what we call the image of this value in M, and this lies, of course, in N. And if these are, say, real numbers, then maybe you can give a definite prescription. This is m squared or something like this. f of m is m squared or something. So this is the notation we're going to use. This is the domain, this is the target, and this is an explicit description of how it's being mapped. And if, depending on what the sets are, uh, you need to prescribe how this goes. In the worst case, you have to draw a picture. Okay? Whatever it takes, you do this. Okay. So. But this is actually true however it is described. We always assume, if I say a map, I assume there is some definite prescription given. Okay? 
some definite prescription is given, then a map f from m to n is called continuous. And continuous is such a word, in fact, the full family name of continuous is continuous with respect to the topology OM on N and with respect to the topology ON on N. But we don't always say that, we just say it is continuous, but now you're educated, you know, ah, specific topologies have been chosen, it's with respect to those, is called continuous with respect to OM and ON if, and this must be the simplest definition ever, if for every set that is open in the target, so you take any open subset here in the target space, you must check for every one, if for every V open in here, the so-called pre-image, it's a grand name, it's a very simple concept, the so-called pre-image of F, uh, with respect to F, of this chosen set, is in fact an open set in the domain. Okay? Of course, what you need to remember is the definition of pre-image. So you have a map from M to N. Now we take a subset V in N. It may be open, and in fact the definition of continuity requires you take an open subset, but the definition of pre-image doesn't care whether it's open or not. Could be any. Then the pre-image of this chosen subset in the domain, in the target, with respect to the map F, is what? It's a subset of the domain. Hence, we can ask, is it open in the domain? Which subset in the domain? It's so simple. It's all those elements in the domain which, if we map them using our f, come to lie in this v. This is very simple. Look at this, Look at this image again. What is the, another color, what if I choose these two here as the subset V in the target, these two elements as the subset V in the target, what's the pre-image of this subset with respect to F? Well, you follow the arrows backwards. This one lies in the pre-image and this one lies in the pre-image. This one doesn't because it doesn't come to lie in V. So these two are the pre-image with respect to F of the chosen set V. So you say, well, it's kind of the inverse. Yeah, careful. Because look at the flower set. I could take another set V twiddle and with only this element, the flower point. What's the pre-image of the V twiddle set with respect to F? Well, you follow all the arrows backwards. It's this set. This is the pre-image of V twiddle with respect to F because each of those, F of each of those comes to lie in V. And now you see, ah, even if the map is not invertible or where the map is not invertible, the pre-image has a notion, but the pre-image of the single one would be the single one, the pre-image of the single one would be this single one. That's, of course, a sign of an invertible part of a map, but here it isn't, but still the pre-image is the whole subset in the domain. So, you check. Is every open set here, that depends on the chosen topology, is the pre-image of every open set open in here? Depends on that topology. It's a very simple concept and it's extremely powerful. And that's it. That's continuity. No epsilons, no deltas. Very simple. Very simple. Yes? Uh, the, the, the diamond guy. So you say if V is the diamond guy, well, that's very simple. What is it? What's the pre-image? Pre-image is the empty set. Very good. So the pre-image of V twiddle twiddle, so that's the, the set with only the diamond element, uh, this is the empty set. 
and the empty set is open. So if this one happened to be an open set, all constitute an open set all by itself, at least under this map, this wouldn't destroy continuity. This one wouldn't. Okay? Very important. And therefore, you see how important it is to have uh, the empty set in the topology, because otherwise, if you make this definition, only surjective maps could be continuous, which is, of course, nonsense. Yes? In this picture, where do you see the topology? The topology? Here you don't. Okay. That's the point. So as I said, um, the pre-image is defined at the map level. The map level only defines to the set structure level. This can all be written. And of course, if I want to define continuity in terms of topologies, I can only put conditions here. This is defined on the set level. But then here, you choose one in the topology in the target. And you check whether it's in the topology in the domain. For this definition, you need the topologies. For the definition of the pre-images, you don't. And in fact, I, cannot, I still cannot say, even if I understand all the pre-images of all the subsets, I still cannot say whether this specific map is continuous unless I decide it for a certain topology here and there. And that's given here. So let's, let's make an example. Yes? One more question. Can I have a map that makes a, a jump in the topology in the topology? So if I have a set N and N, topology 1 and 2, can I have a, a map that makes a connection between those two? If I choose... Yes. In fact, the continuous maps, as it says, it's, I mean, if the map was, let's say the map was bijective, it was a one-to-one -one map, then the pre-image could, of course, be written as F inverse of the set V, of the set V. And then if you have maps that are continuous in both directions, then not only the pre-images of open sets are open, but also the images of open sets are open because the inverse pulls it back. The, the pre-image of the inverse is the image of the map. And so it's maps that are bijective and in both directions continuous. They preserve the topological structure and they have a specific name. They're called homeomorphisms. In German, homeomorphisms. In English, homeo, E-O, homeomorphisms. And there are the structure-preserving maps of topology. That's exactly right. It's a very, very deep question because mathematicians always classify structures by identifying them if certain structure-preserving maps between them exist. Okay, fine. So let's, um, further question at this point? Good. So um, let's make an example. No, I already had an example. Yes, but I would like to write down the mnemonic phrase. So if you want to remember this definition, it's very easy to remember. A map is continuous if and only if, well, it's the if of a definition, so exactly if, is continuous if the pre-images of, in brackets, all, of course, we mean, open sets are open sets. The pre-images of open sets are open sets. The only point is that the pre-image of open sets, and here you should say in the target space, are open sets in the domain. Because the pre-image lies in the domain, and the pre-image of a map uh, of, a, of a subset needs to be the subset, a subset in the target, because otherwise you can't take the pre-image. So the short formula pre-images of open sets are open sets. These open sets refer to a topology on the target, whereas these, of course, must refer to a, pol to, to a topology on the domain, as it's written down precisely here. OK? So that is, yes, yes. No, no, and I can't because I, I am emphasize that the standard topology is only defined on R to the D. This here is not an R to the D, so on this one I can't define the standard topology. It's a very important thing. So, and the standard topology, it has this deceptive name standard topology as if there was anything mathematically special about it. There's nothing special about the standard topology. 
other than that you like it because it was the first topology you implicitly met in the beginning of your studies. Okay? But that's not a good reason for space-time to carry it. Right? So, so this is a very important point. It's called standard, and that reconcile makes you... I mean, this is somehow to, to make you happy, and other people do the same trick. Um, but it means nothing, and, and it can only be established on some RD, whereas on an arbitrary set it can't even be talked about. Okay? Very important point. So we take it always very general unless we say which one, which one we chose. Okay. So, um, aha. Okay, let's, let's make an example. Let's make an example. And in fact, I had one. I don't find it, so I... Ah, haha, -ha. here it is. Example. So let's say M is the set 1, 2, 3. We had it before. And let's say N, the target, is the same set. Why not? I can go from set 1, 2, 3 to the set 1, 2, 3 uh, with a map. No, we make it even simpler. We only take 1 and 2 and 1 and 2. So let's invent a map. One map is, there's the 1, there's the 2, there's the set 1, 2 again, and just for fun, I, set, I map the 1 to the 2, and I map the 2 to the 1. Why would I not do that? Uh, that's the map F from M to N I want to look at. Okay? Very simple one. And now I establish topologies on these sets. And I choose, well, it's a definition, I choose to establish on M the topology with the elements empty set, set with element 1, set with element 2, and set 1, 2. This is a topology. And on N, I establish a different topology. Although it's the same set, I'm free to choose a different topology. I establish the empty set 1, 2. That's a topology 2. So, the question is, is F continuous? What do we have to do to check whether F continuous, again, not by all by itself, but with respect to the chosen topologies, whether F is continuous, we need to check what is the pre-image with respect to F of just every open subset this is this all, for all, for just every open subset in the target, we need to check whether the pre-image lies is an open subset in the domain. What are the open subsets of the target? Well, I can completely enumerate that. I need to study these two pre-images because these are the only open sets in the target. What is the pre-image of the empty set? What are all the elements in here that come to lie nowhere? None. Because it's a map. Everything is mapped. By the definition of map. What is the pre-image of the set 1, 2 with respect to F? Well, set 1, 2 is the entire set. The pre-image is the entire set. So this is all of M, correct? But all of M, by the axioms of a topology, lies in OM. And the empty set also lies in OM. So in fact, we checked thus, F is continuous. This map is continuous. Now you will be very surprised, because this was only part A of it. Now I do part B, and I do the following thing. I now look at the map that goes the opposite way, that starts in here and goes in here, which as a set is the same thing. So I call this the map G, because it has a different domain, different target. And again, N is 1, 2, M is 1, 2, and the G map be defined by this. So you say, it's the same map, it has exactly the same prescription, yes? Okay, so, 
we're talking about this equal sign is in question or But, okay, so the point is the pre-image of the empty set with respect to f is, let's see whether I was right, is the set of all m in m for which f of m lies in the empty set. Now, if f is a map, then every element of m is mapped to some element of the target. Uh, so it's an element of the target, but not of the empty set, because if f of m was in the empty set, then this m wouldn't have an image. But because f is a map, every element here must have an image. If the map would, the notion of a map would allow for this little Christmas tree point here to not be mapped, if this was still a map, if only these guys are mapped, but this one isn't, then the image of this under f would be nothing because there is no image. Yes, but then m would not, still not be the pre image. I'm just saying this is the argument to show the second. Okay, no m in m satisfies this. So you take all the m in m that satisfy this condition. But any m in m is mapped to a non empty to something in n. Hence, none of these satisfies this condition. So none. N no condition, so that means it's the empty set. I think it's clear. It's, ultimately, it's the definition of map. Maybe we can discuss later if, you, if you're not satisfied. I think that's true. Okay, so now we go the opposite direction. I again give this prescription. say, oh, it's the map F. Because, well, M actually is N. And Okay, you're right. It's actually the map A F. But... Not if I keep with it that the M is equipped with one topology and the N is equipped with another topology because I now have this other topology on the domain and the other topology on the target. I could have also said I swapped the topologies. But uh, you can also think of this G as the inverse of F, the inverse map, because that is what it is, right? It changes one, two, and it exchanges it back. You say, well, if the map is continuous, the bijective map, the inverse will be continuous too. Well, check for every open set in here, for every open set in here, check whether the pre-image is open. So we start pre-image with respect to F inverse of, um, of one. So I take an open set in the target Let's start with this one. Of course, I start with this one because this already spells catastrophe, so I don't need to write too much. So if it's true, I must check for every open set in here. So for instance, for this one, what's the pre-image of the set with the element 1? Well, it's the set with the element 2, right? But the set with the element 2, unfortunately, cannot be found anywhere in the topology of the now domain not continuous, F inverse, not continuous. And to make it even worse, if I hadn't exchanged one and two, it would be the identity map from one space with one topology to another space, to the same space with another topology. The identity map could be continuous in one direction, and the inverse of the identity map, which is of course the identity map again, could be not continuous because you chose different topologies. Do you see how dangerous it is to not explicitly talk about the topologies? Uh, blackboard, please. Uh. In these examples, okay, so let's, for instance, um, focus on this topology, okay, and let me write down an, um, a closed set for you. I claim that 2, which is an open set, I claim that it's also closed. I claim 2 is closed since... What do I need to check? I need to check whether the entire set without that set 
is in the topology, but it is because the entire set is 1, 2. 1, 2 without 2 is 1, but 1 we see also lies in there, for instance. Okay? It has nothing to do whatsoever with the image of the boundary being there or not. Although boundary, this notion we have in the standard topology, can be defined for any topology. So these notions carry over, but our pictures of the notions not necessarily do. That, that would be an example. So this has nothing to do with continuity, but is a remark on the previous terminology on closed sets. Okay, so we introduced our little notion of continuity for general maps between any two topological spaces. Now in the beginning I drew this curve in a set that makes a jump all of a sudden. What does it mean? Is it not continuous? Well, a curve would be something that goes from the real line, which is the curve parameter, if you wish, into some other set. But you need to equip the real line, the parameter space, where the curve takes it param its parameters, with a topology, and you need to equip the space in which the curve runs, also with a topology, in order to start talking about the curve making jumps or not, where making jumps I translate as is continuous or not. And in the, few, in the following, in the whole lectures, whenever we have the real numbers, or the real numbers cross the real numbers cross to so R to the D, if nothing else is said, I will always implicitly assume that we establish the standard topology. The standard topology on the line, the real line, the standard topology on the real plane. So if nothing is said, then R or RD carries the standard topology, so I don't need to write so much. Okay? But the other spaces we will have in space-time will not be RD or R4 or something. Space-time will be a topological space all in, by itself. Okay, anyway, so that was this remark. Now, uh, there is a very important notion of composition of maps, which is again defined at the set level, and the uh, map and set level, but you can ask what is is the composition of two continuous maps, is it again continuous? And that's a very important question. So that's section number three, composition, composition of continuous maps. So the situation is very simple. You have a map F that goes from M to N, and sometimes I write the F on the arrow, that means the same as before, it takes you from the domain to the target, and imagine there is another uh, map G that takes you from the target to yet another target. And then you can define a new map from the data given these two F and G, you may define a map that's called G after F, well first F then G, so G after F, which is a map, as it's indicated here, from M to P. And now I can tell you how the composition is made. An element in M is being mapped to, well, that's the name of the game, G after F of M. But this now has a definition. And the definition is you first apply F and then you apply G. Of course, the composition of maps. Uh, if you can write down so simply, why do you introduce this notation? Well, this is the map, and this is already the image of, of a point under the map. So I want to like to be able to talk about the map itself. That's why I call this G after F. And we have a key theorem, very simple to prove. Maybe we'll do this. Key theorem, it says if F is continuous, and G is continuous, then it follows that G after F is also continuous. Let's prove this, just for fun. What do we need to check? We need to check whether G after F is continuous, and we may assume this. So G after F continuous, we need to check, let V be any open set in the topology on P. I've, of course, chosen topologies OM, ON, OP. 
if V is any open set in here, I study the pre-image of G after F of this subset. What is the pre-image? Well, by definition, it's all those M in the domain of the map such that G after F of the M comes to lie in the chosen open set. But what is this? This is all the M in M for which F of M lies in the pre-image of G uh, with respect to G of this V. Okay? But that is, of course, nothing but the pre-image with respect to F of the pre-image with respect to G of V. Ah, but G is continuous and V is an open set in the target of G as well. So this must be an element by this continuity, must be an element in ON. Ah, but F is continuous, so, and this is an open set here in the target, so it must be an open set in the domain of F. Ah, but this is what we wanted to show for any open set here. The pre-image with respect to this map is open here, which we just did, so the theorem is proven. Do this with epsilons and deltas in Rd, okay? But this is always true. We only use the definition of continuity and the topological space. Okay? Very important thing. Last thing for today, six minutes. Inheriting a topology. If you're old enough, you know that inheritance is a good thing. And... Um, it's also good if you have some topological space, you have a topology somewhere, or you have one or two or three topological spaces, construct a new one from what you already got. And one, there are many ways to inherit topologies from sets, and every way to inherit a topology in a certain situation has a certain advantage. One we need, so I should say many useful ways, many useful ways to... Uh, inherit a topology from some given topological space or depending on the construction spaces, maybe you have three parents. Um, important for us, particularly important for us, for space-time physics, so that the physicists keep motivated, uh, space-time physics is the following. Assume you have a set M on which you are happy enough to already be given a topology. You already have a topological space. And now you consider a subset S of a topological space. Some sub, not an open subset, any subset. Could be any subset. Question, can you make S itself into a topology? Question, can one construct on S or for S a topology from the topology OM on M? Of course, I mean, I can always invent a topology on S but maybe I want a special topology that in some way I get from M, and I'll tell you in a second why this is interesting. And the answer is yes. And an important way to do so is the so-called subset topology. You define a topology on S. This is now not OS, but O slash S, so the restriction to S if you want. But this now needs to be a subset of the power set of S supposed to be a topology in S, define this OS as follows explicitly. You say it's all the sets that have the shape U intersected S. So any element in the topology must be writable as U intersection S, where U is any set in the given topology you already have. That's the definition. And there is a claim well, you can call this a topology, and it's actually called the subset topology. 
subset topology in brackets inherited from topology on the superset. Well, M is the superset. M is the superset of S. But the claim is it really is a topology. I don't only call it topology, it is a topology. Let's very quickly check that. We need to check is the empty set as a subset of S, is it in there? Well, of course it is, because I can write the empty set as the empty set as a subset of M intersected S. This is clearly true. But because this here is in OM, it follows that the empty set is in OS, as it is defined. What about the whole set S? The whole set S needs to be in the topology of S. I write the whole set of S, I write it as M intersected S. Well, M intersected S is clearly S, because S is a subset, but M is in OM, so the set S is of the form some open set in M intersected S, so therefore the whole set S is in the topology. Second axiom, let's take a U, uh, to, uh, a U in S and a V in S. Now it's getting confusing. Uh, I should call this, um, uh, yeah, a in S and B in S, I need to check whether the intersection is in S. Well, if A is in S, then it means there exists an A twiddle in OM and a B twiddle in OM such that A is A twiddle intersected S and B is B twiddle intersected S because I say all open sets in S, oh sorry, they should be in OS, right, uh, must have this form. But if this is true, I can study the intersection A intersected B is A twiddle intersected S brackets intersected B twiddle intersected S bracket. But of course, the bracket is associated, um, the um, intersection is associative. So an, an S intersected S is S and so on. So I get A twiddle intersected B twiddle intersected S. But A twiddle B twiddle lie in OM but that's a topology, so they lie in here. So again, the intersection of A and B is of this form, so the whole thing here lies in O sub S, and for the union it's the same thing. Okay, I'm not going to write it down for time reasons. So in fact, we define something, we call it a topology, but then of course we can prove it's a topology. Final word, use of this specific way to inherit to inherit a topology uh, from a superset. Well, the idea is the following. Very often, it's very easy for you to judge whether a certain map from M to N, where you know the topology on here and you know the topology on here is continuous. Let's assume because of the specific topologies chosen, I'll give you an, exa an example in a second, let's assume it's very easy to decide whether this is continuous. Continuous. Say that's easy. For some reason, we know. Now, you want to know something different. You want to know if you only consider a subset of the original domain, and you consider the map from the subset into N, which you usually call the restriction of F only to the subset. You want to do this very often. For example, from R2 to R, you write down some prescription how this maps, um, then you know every point of R2, how it goes to the real line somehow. For instance, a temperature distribution where these are the isotherms, right? This is a temperature distribution, such a map, right? Now imagine for some reason you're not interested in the temperature on this hot plate, but on this hot plate you have a little wire that goes like this, and for some reason you have a mouse that you mounted onto the wire with some little wheels, okay? And the mouse is only interested so if this is the subset S of R2, the mouse is of course only interested in the temperature where it can pass.
pass. It's a very natural situation, and it's very natural to decide the continuity of such a map. You use your undergraduate analysis notion. But if this is a complicated wire, this map here, T sub S, well, that's quite a beast. It can look very complicated because this here is given in a complicated way. Now, assume this is continuous with respect to the standard topology on here and here. Okay, then if you decide to equip S with just some topology you come up with, then you cannot conclude that if this is continuous, then this will be continuous too, because it depends on the topology you choose on the subset S. But if you decide to choose on S the topology you have on here by inheriting it to here, so constructing from this topology this specific one I wrote down here, then you're guaranteed, then it follows that the restriction of the map, which then goes from S to N, is again continuous. Okay? There you see, it's a very natural thing to consider this particular one. This can also be proven in a few lines. Again, we're already three minutes over time. I'm not going to do this. So the wrap up is, we defined, we took a set, we established a topology in order to talk about continuity. If you leave the room, uh, I hope there are the problem sheets. Not yet. Okay, after the coffee break, after the coffee break, there are two tables and there are a number of problem sheets. On, from each stack, you take a sheet and those are the problem sheets for the first lecture this morning and for the second lecture. And these problem sheets, you just come to the tutorial this afternoon. Where are they in the bank, bank building lower floor? Okay. You come there, we divide you into groups, you sit there and you go through a worksheet under the competent advice of our tutors and you practice these notions. Please come, it will really make everything very clear and you're fully prepared for the next round of lectures on Wednesday. So we have now half an hour coffee break, is that correct? And then at a quarter two, we start again. Next lecture, topological manifolds. Thank you.